hello and welcome in this special lecture we're going to talk about antiparticles antiparticles has been a constant source of mystery for most people of course particle physicists have known antiparticles for a long long time in fact the first time it was detected was in 1934 if i get my history correct in 1932 or 1933 i forget a very smart person called paul dirac who is one of the greatest physicists who ever lived wrote an equation called well not surprisingly the dirac equation the dirac equation predicted something called antiparticles it later turned out the dirac equation uh, the, the the dirac equation described electrons and so we must have something called an anti electron now an antiparticle and there have been lots of myths about antiparticles and an antiparticles really a particle which has opposite this is opposite charge it is the same mass it is the same spin it is the same everything except the charge of course some particles can be its own antiparticle for example the photon is its own antiparticle because it's neutral neutrons however are not its own antiparticles because they're fermions and they have an internal structure and we're going to discuss about this uh, maybe sometime later in the course let's talk about fundamental particles and exactly uh, the, the and again, our uh, most uh, familiar fundamental particles, of course, an electron. Okay, and we're going to talk about antiparticles in, um, with respect to an electron. People in the 1930s and before that, and even after that, uh, worked on something called the bubble chamber. And the bubble chamber worked like this. It was basically a chamber filled with supersaturated water vapor. Okay. Now, what do you mean by supersaturated? It just means that the water vapor, the, the air has enough water vapor in it, such that any tiny disturbance is going to make the water vapor condense into water. But of course, that's not happening because there is no tiny disturbance. This phenomena was exploited in something called a bubble chamber. If a particle went through and caused enough disturbance, it would leave a track. Okay? And that track would be of water vapor. Okay? So it would form beads of water vapor like this. It's like droplets if, if a charged particle, if any particle in fact, passed through which caused enough disturbance for the water vapor to condense. This method was later substituted with a more improved method and this involved putting a magnetic field and this was uh, just for charged particles putting a magnetic field on a photographic plate so if this is a photographic plate if this is a photographic plate okay and you put the magnetic field into this is magnetic field going into Okay. When we have an into, we are going to write a cross sign. The in cross sign means it's going into the page. Okay, I can't draw something like that. If the magnetic field is going into the page, and if there is a charged particle which is moving here, say Q, okay, then it, due to the magnetic field, it's going to move around in a curved path. So the message to note down is magnetic fields make charged particles move in circles okay so charged part so charged particles move around in circles when you have an applied magnetic field okay of course if you have the opposite charge it will move in the opposite direction okay so opposite charged particles or rather just right opposite charge is then opposite direction okay now the charged the, ch the charged particle has a particular charge and is a particular mass and the radius the radius of the path is dependent 
on the charge by mass ratio so it's dependent on the charged by mass ratio okay and we call this the e by m ratio the e is for the charge and m is for the mass so this is how the radius of the charged particle depends okay now let's just come to a particular figure which i wanted to show you and i hope everybody can see this figure properly yes okay so this figure is taken is actually a photographic plate figure this is a real event which is happening and uh, of course when a real event happens it's it's seldom as clean as this but this is a pretty clean event and forget about all the writing the right we, we're going to arrive at the writing say so th this is what you actually see okay so you have a bunch of squiggly lines and you're supposed to make head or tail out of the, all that squiggly lines okay now let's just see what's happening the most prominent feature of this diagram are these two spirals and the spirals are you can measure them they're roughly equal this if if if, if you measure this and if you measure this you will see that the the radius the radius here and the radius here are roughly equal okay of course this radius is much bigger but that's because there was some other interference in the middle okay. and also the radius dies off almost at the same rate okay this means of course there is a charged particle now when charged particles move when charged particles are accelerated when they move in um, when they move in curved paths they radiate energy and if they radiate energy obviously lose energy so charged particles moving in curved paths radiate energy and this is what's detected on a photographic plate okay so now you have a magnetic field I think it was into the into the plane of the paper if it's into the plane of the paper then the electron which has a negative charge will move in this direction and from the radius of the path it can be it can be determined that it's this negative particle is actually an electron and nothing else so we determine the charge by mass ratio and then we determine that the radius is actually that of an electron okay but then we have another particle starting from the very very same point you can see okay and this is the same point and it's going in this opposite direction so obviously it's of the opposite charge because remember opposite charge means opposite direction and since the radii the radius of this and the radius of this are nearly the same the charge by mass is almost the same so you have another particle which is has the same charge by mass that of an electron except that it's the opposite charge so the mass is obviously the same except that it is opposite charge and the detection flips so now you detect a particle which is actually called an anti-electron or a positron okay it's a positive particle which has the same mass as that of the electron except it has every property which is just like an electron except that its charge is opposite okay this very nice long line is nothing but another electron being scattered and there is no uh, no second second positron being created along this path because then you would see another line going in the opposite direction which does not happen so what's actually happening is the there there is a photon a particle of light coming in it's called it's a gamma ray photon coming in okay and of course a photon is not detected because it's not charged if it's not charged it doesn't radiate energy okay if it doesn't radiate energy it's not caught in a photographic plate so it's invisible on a photographic plate so photographic plates catch only charged particles so this comes in and then this forms a pair that forms an electron pair and a positron pair this is by the way called pair production okay so this is called pair production So, you have an electron, you have a positron, and you have a scattered electron. Just ignore the scattered electron for the time being. So, now you have this particle, which was never known before, which is predicted, but it was not known before. And now, you can actually see it appear on your photographic plate. Okay. Thus, an antiparticle was discovered. This happened first in 1934, and 
the Nobel Prize went to Carl Anderson who first discovered the antiparticle and the Nobel Prize went in 1936 and if you know anything about the Nobel Prizes you will know that Nobel Prizes are not given out that fast until and unless it's a super important experiment. Of course the discovery of antiparticles is a super important discovery. You have a whole lot, a whole bunch of particles which is the exact copy of this particle. Okay. Last time we talked about symmetry, this one, this time we are going to talk about something called charge symmetry. Okay, And it is this charge symmetry which relate particles okay, with antiparticles. Okay. These two are related by charge symmetry. In other words, if you take an electron and you flip the charge, okay, it becomes an anti-electron or a positron. Okay. If you flip the charge of an electron, it becomes the anti-electron or the positron. Okay, and vice versa. If you take a positron and you flip the charge, it will become an electron. Of course, all the matter that you know around us are made up of these types of particles, the electrons, and not the antimatter particles, which are the positrons. Okay, New, they, there are only protons and not antiprotons that you see, but antiprotons have been produced in experiments, so they exist. Okay, nature has an exact symmetry with respect to positive with respect to matter and antimatter in, in in the sense that it produces equal amounts of matter and antimatter in all experiments no experiment till date has been able to find any sort of deviation from the number of matter and antimatter particles produced so if you have 10 matter particles produced in an experiment you will have exactly 10 antimatter particles produced in the same experiment however since you see everything in the universe made out of just matter particles and not antimatter particles, you are forced to conclude that there must have been an excess of matter particles over antimatter particles. So particles must have won over antiparticles at some stage of the universe and some stage of the evolution of the universe. And this is the huge, huge question. This is the big question that we're going to raise. And the big question is this. Why does matter dominate in the universe? Okay, we see an asymmetry, but we do we cannot explain the asymmetry, and this is called something as baryon asymmetry. Forget about the term baryon. We are going to uh, encounter it later in the course, and we are going to see what baryon means. But this is called a baryon asymmetry, in the sense that there is more matter, okay, than antimatter, and. So matter dominates antimatter. For some reason, the number of matter particles is much, much larger than antimatter particles. Okay, but we do not know why. This is an open question. We are, we are trying to resolve it, but this is, of course, an open question. We do not know how to answer it. So that's it for now. In fact, that's it for the week on this particle physics course we are going to i'm going to see you next week on um, this we're going to continue from this we're going to do uh, the bohr atom and i'm going to tell you a little bit about units all that next week and a little bit more thank you